Welcome to Dominican University of California. The Leadership Lecture Series is so, so thrilled to be a partner to One Book, One Marin. And this is our fifth year of partnership, and it is just thrilling. I wanted you to see that we have filled the place. Unfortunately, because of our fire code rules, we will have to ask some people who have come later to stand outside. We will keep the doors open just to make sure that you have a chance to hear, but we do need to make sure that we follow that, that safety rule. So please make sure we do that. So thank you for coming. Are you excited? We are excited too, and we're so thrilled to have, have this great partnership. This is the end of our series for the spring. Who's come before? All right, several people, even, even before this semester. So look forward to our programs for, for next semester in the fall. It's a pleasure. So it is my honor to introduce Scott Bauer, who is the Deputy Director of Marin County Libraries, because One Book, One Berlin is a major community event sponsored by our libraries. And I'd like to introduce Scott, who will explain what One Book, One Marin is and why we are all here this evening. Scott? Thank you, Denise. Um, I'd also like to extend my welcome to everybody for the coming out to the concluding evening of the fifth year of the One Book, One Marin celebration. And it's a, truly a celebration by Marin of the importance of books and of reading and of our community. Reading a great book has us think about ourselves, our environment, and our relationships. And talking about these books with our friends and our families and our neighbors adds richness and depth to the experience of reading. One Book, One Marin has blossomed in Marin because of the unique collaboration of our bookstores, especially Books Passage. <laughs> Dominican University of California and their Alamany Library. and all of our public libraries, San Rafael, <laughs> San Anselmo, Sausalito, Mill Valley, Belvedere Tiburon, Larkspur, and the 10 branches of the Marin County Free Library. Each of these partners comes with particular strengths and the result is an unparalleled opportunity for Marin's book lovers to read, discuss, and to build community among ourselves. This year's select selection, Abraham Verghese's Cutting for Stone, has energized us with an unforgettable story. The doors it opens to sharing and discussion and the opportunities it gives us, gave us for special programming. Um, at our libraries alone, hundreds of people have attended programs ranging from classical Indian dance to demonstrations of Ethiopian cooking. Who would have guessed there'd be such pent-up demand to be eating in the library? <laughs> None of this could have happened without the support of our wonderful community partners and our generous sponsors. So please take a moment to read the list of, of them behind me. It's a wide range of individuals and businesses and corporations, which is really quite astounding. I'd especially like to acknowledge a, a contribution made by um, the late Supervisor Charles McGlashan, who had been there from the very start of One Book, One Marin, and helped support us and get us going in the beginning. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to a woman who really doesn't need my introduction, the president of Book Passage and the self-described fiercely independent owner of the fiercely independent bookstore in Corte Madera, Elaine Petricelli. I'm so excited because I love this book. Uh, I, I've had the best time all season because wherever I go, in cafes, on uh, bus, backs of buses, everywhere I see this book and I'm hoping they were all bought from me so I really am excited. <laughs> but if not, I hope you got them at the library. Uh, We've been very lucky at One Book, One Marin that the community has been so supportive. But we've been especially lucky that Dr. Michael Krasny has been 
so helpful to this project and been willing to be in conversation with each of our authors at the final culminating event. And I think most of you know Dr. Krasny. He is a professor at San Francisco State University where he teaches English. Many of us know him because we spend our mornings with him uh, from 9 to 11 on KQED forum where he interviews some of the most interesting people in the world, especially authors. I love when he interviews authors, especially if he interviews them in the morning before that author comes to Book Passage, because then I know it's going to be a big success for me. Uh, Dr. Krasny has written uh, textbooks, but he has written two terrific books for those of us who are not getting our PhD. And um, his first one was Off Mic, a mem memoir of a li the life in radio and literary. And if you want to know what those people are really like when the mic's turned off, uh, he can tell you. Uh, his latest book, Spiritual Indy, an Agnostic's Quest, was a Northern California bookseller's pick as one of the best books of the year, one of the best new books. So we're very, very honored that he would give us so much of himself in doing this tonight. Dr. Abraham Verghese is uh, a prince. <laughs> he, he is one of the most giving authors. And uh, we first met him at Book Passage when he wrote the book, My Own Country, about his uh, time as a young doctor in a small, smoky mountain town where no one could possibly have AIDS. But of course, that wasn't true. You often read about Dr. Verghese or you hear him on the radio, see an op-ed in the New York Times or something in the um, New Yorker in which he talks about practicing medicine. He has this really weird idea about practicing medicine. He thinks that doctors should talk to patients, <laughs> listen to them, and maybe even examine them before ordering expensive uh, machines to attack them. His second book, The Tennis Partner, is an absolutely beautiful story of a great friendship between Dr. Verghese and one of his uh, dear friends, a doctor who he uh, knew and loved so much and who went through so much. This too has been one of, uh, the New York Times picked it as one of the most important books of the year. The first book was picked by Time Magazine as the book of the year. And then there is Cutting for Stone. Oh, my dears. Uh, I just, I'm not going to tell you too much about Cutting for Stone because you've all read it. You've all read it twice. But I just want to say that this is a book that will be lasting through the ages. I heard someone say not too long ago that it's one of the three best books she thinks she's ever read. And I think that it's right up there on top. Uh, I... Thank you all for being part of One Book, One Marin, and I especially thank uh, Drs. Krasny and Dr. Verghese for giving us so much, and I present them to you, Abraham Verghese and Michael Krasny. I've done this five years. I've never seen it so full, so the first question is, how does it feel to be a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's you, Michael, not me. <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely you. In fact, uh, I can't tell you how many people have said, and I think I can maybe throw this back to the audience. I love that book, Cutting for Stone. And it's funny because when you talked about the success of this book, you said, no, I didn't expect it, but I certainly welcomed it, in words to that effect. Uh, I mean, you in fact kind of fantasized about this sort of success, but not thinking necessarily that it would arrive. Yes and no, Michael. So the, the honest answer is that um, you know, when people ask me, did you ever imagine this book would do so well and be on the bestseller list for so long? The honest answer is, yes, I imagined it. I certainly had no, <laughs> I had no certainty that it would, it would happen. In fact, I haven't told this in a, in, a, in a public audience before, but I actually had a graphic artist develop a, a cover for me seven years ago, just for my own edification. And it had the title of the book, it had a nun walking off in the distance, and it had all the prizes this book had won, and it had... 
It had 60 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, and that part came true. And uh, no one had seen this except my immediate family. And, but every time I sat down to write, I saw it. Mm. And uh, you know, I think that the, the message is that I think if you're going to write a book, you should certainly aspire to write a book that does this. Uh, if you or have the cover made early on. <laughs> Indeed. Eight so, years went into the writing of this book. It did. And let's, let's talk about the genesis of it or how it evolved. I mean, so many writers talk about an early image or something that provided the catalyst. What was it for you? For me, it was an image of a beautiful South Indian nun. And I imagined her giving birth in a mission hospital a continent away from where she grew up. And that's pretty much all I had. And I also had a great desire to, to populate the book with everything I loved about medicine. I've always thought that the study of medicine was a sort of a romantic, exciting, mysterious pursuit. And I wanted to put every bit of that in there. But that's really all I had. And uh, for those of you about to embark on a novel, I hope you have a hell of a lot more than that when you, when you start out. And that's partly why it took eight years. It was a lot of trying to discover what the book would turn out to be. Did you know early on that you were going to initially set things in Ethiopia, where you had lived so many years? I did. I think I was very taken with the idea of uh, medicine in a resource-poor uh, area, one that I was very familiar with. Uh, I did very much want to call on my childhood experiences in Ethiopia. So very much like the main character, Marion, uh, I was born in Ethiopia. And I lived through the very same political, social events that happens, uh, that Marion lives through. Uh, and so I, I knew I wanted to use that as a backdrop. And I wanted to use geography as a character. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in the phrase, geography is destiny which was actually coined by, uh, by, by Napoleon, yeah. talking about France's position in the world. And I, I wanted geography and the change in geography that came about in the book to change the destiny of people. Geography changed by dislocation, by revolution, by immigration, by all of those kinds of things that mean a different fate, essentially. Yeah, I mean, just, just the very fact of being born in a certain place, uh, like this wonderful place, changes your destiny in a very uh, you know, obvious way. Uh, having to move or deciding to move also brings about a, a change in your destiny. So I think it's a very self-evident concept, but a very nice one to, to work with in a, in a novel. Did you know that your Carmelite nun was going to give birth to twins? Or the twins I, were going to be born out of her, I should say? I actually did not. I was writing that birth scene over many months, and uh, it was a fairly dramatic scene, and I was getting quite excited by it myself. And, I thought, you know, if I put another child in there, it'll be even more dramatic. And so, <laughs> and uh, that is really how the twins came about. And, you know, I think twins are potentially a great trap for writers because uh, Bollywood loves twins. I mean, you know, they, they have, every other movie has a twin and the same actor gets paid to play both parts. And, <laughs> but once I had the twins, then, of course, I began to be very interested in in the very fact that twins are the closest thing we have to clones, uh, human clones. And if there are any differences between twins, identical twins, then it comes from the environment. And I like the idea of having one twin be affected by the environment, so to speak, at the very moment of birth. Mm -hmm. Which but also ties in, since the twins wind up in different places, with the notion of geography being destiny? Very much so, yes, indeed. Yeah, I mean, that is another kind of geography. In fact, it's funny you should mention that because I was taught that phrase, geography is destiny, as having been coined by Freud. It was actually taught to me in medical school as something Freud said mm -hmm. in the context of the birth canal being in such close proximity to all the other interesting organs that are nearby. <laughs> and uh, as a medical student, it seemed quite clever, you know? <laughs> and, and I was quite disappointed in, in my in my specialty to discover that Freud never said that, or if he did it, he was <laughs> paraphrasing Napoleon. Well, here you are blending medicine and literature and medicine and storytelling in ways that we associate with Chekhov or, for that matter, someone like William Carlos Williams, who was more a poet but also a storyteller with Patterson and things of that sort. And it's fascinating the way you are able to bring the two together as if there's a real synchronicity between them. I mean, in, in some respects, that was your intent, was it not? 
I suppose so. I mean, I, it was my intent. Um, it's, I, I, I'm a big fan of William Carlos Williams. Uh, I love his work, but I also love his life. I remember reading that in his 70th year, he wrote to a friend to say that he was giving up his evening clinics. Uh, and if I remember this correctly, I think he actually was a well-known poet, a contemporary of Ezra Pound, yeah. before he became a medical Pound was a mentor to him, in fact. And then he chose to go to medical school because he felt, as I do feel too, that if you're going to write about the world, you, you have to be sort of swimming in the river of life. And uh, the particular river of life of being a physician is, very, is a very um, you know, intense one. You are seeing people at their most vulnerable moments. You are sort of seeing life at the very, uh, you know, at the very crucial moments. And I, I think that that's become a very important way for me to have something to say that is meaningful. And it comes out, I hope, in the, in the novels and in my other work. Indeed it does. And I think you said at one point that probably the most seminal experience for you was as an orderly? It was. I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily so at the time. Uh, when I left Ethiopia uh, in the middle of my medical school training because of civil war, I actually wound up coming to this country and joining my parents who had come here a few years before that and they were teaching school in New Jersey. And I couldn't simply just transfer back into another medical school uh, for a very simple reason. I did not have an undergraduate degree. Uh, in many parts of the world, the Commonwealth especially, you go straight from high school to pre-med to, to medical school. And so I was kind of stuck and I uh, began to work as an orderly and I did that for almost a year uh, in a nursing home and then in a hospital. And I really look back on that now, especially now, as having been the most important medical training of my, of my life because I really got to see what happens to the patient in the 23 hours and 57 minutes that the doctors are not in the room. And um, it, it gave me a very healthy appreciation for my, my colleagues in nursing. And, uh, uh, you know, it's something that I never lost. There's always a sense of great identification with the nurse and the other staff who are really the ones who are providing the care. But there was also... Yeah. Thank you. I, I want to explore that some more with you because I think you have a humanistic vision of medicine which is an important one for just as Elaine in her introduction kind of touched on and it has to do with touching as well as other things but th there, there's a sense that you made yourself into a novelist. Uh, you, you wrote those other two books, a lot of them born out of experience in eastern Tennessee and then came to decide to be a novelist by going to the University of Iowa to the writer's workshop. Right? Actually, it was not quite like that. So I, I, I think I always loved uh, fiction. I loved reading. And I, and I have a very sort of serious view of fiction. To me, it's not entertainment. I love the phrase that Dorothy Allison uses. She says, fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. Uh, fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And I love that. I think that, you know, and I'm, I'm impatient with people who say, well, oh, I don't read fiction. I'm a serious kind of person. And I, and I always say, well, what about Uncle Tom's Cabin? Mm -hmm. I mean, that ended slavery in this country. Talk about the power of a novel. So I actually f went to Iowa first with the intention of writing a novel. And um, when I was leaving the Iowa Writers' Workshop, I got a story accepted in, in The New Yorker, a dark AIDS short story called Lilacs. And I thought, well, this is it. This is how I'm going to tell the AIDS narrative. Um, but instead of which, The New Yorker was very interested in my doing a non-fiction piece on AIDS in rural America and uh, maybe a two-part piece. And I remember being quite excited because The New Yorker at the time paid a dollar a word and I thought 100,000 words would be just right for them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to make a long story short, they, they turned down the, the proposal uh, for many reasons. The editor was leaving and Tina Brown came on board and I did work for her, but not this piece. She didn't want this piece. And so I was left with a nonfiction book proposal and had to sort of retool when, when a contract came in. My agent said, you know, this is a, this is a pr book proposal. Let's shop it around. And uh, there was a real excitement about the idea of a heterosexual foreign physician in rural Tennessee telling the story of the AIDS epidemic. And uh, pretty soon I had a contract. And I had to learn how to write nonfiction. It wasn't something that I had set out to do. I'd but always set out to write a novel. It, it became a natural kind of trajectory from that to the fiction then. Yeah. I don't think it was a natural, it was almost an escape in the sense that I, I think that writing nonfiction to me, uh, the great advantage of writing nonfiction 
is if something really happened, you and I have an inherent interest in it that is hard to match. And that is why, you know, take the O.J. Simpson story. You know, as fiction, it's tawdry. It's not even halfway interesting. It sounds, you know, it sounds like a very cheap plot. But because it really happened, look how much time you and I wasted on that story. Um, so I understood that the power of nonfiction was that you had the reader's attention by virtue of the fact that this was real. The downside was you couldn't make up. You could rearrange, you could dramatize, but... Unless your name is Greg Mortensen. Or... <laughs> And so the, the, the liberating thing for me <laughs> to write a... It sounded like a cheap shot because it was. <laughs> I found fiction liberating in that I could now make up. I could make anything I wanted happen. I could have a narrator speak from the womb. Uh, but the great difficulty was that you have to grab the reader's attention on page one or two and make them forget that, you know, they're reading this book that's a made-up story and have them enter this world and never let them down till the very end. And that is a real challenge. It's a joy, but it's a real challenge. And you never are quite sure that you've, you've pulled it off. And uh, uh, my sense of that I might have pulled it off was really when I was driving up to Book Passage uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, I, I was thinking to myself, who in the world is going to be there on a Saturday afternoon? And, the website listed about seven different authors every hour. Somebody was doing something. And I drove up, and the place was packed. And uh, I just suddenly had a sense that, that this story, this ambition of mine, had finally uh, caught hold. And uh, it was a very, very exciting moment. Very gratifying, yeah. Very. I should add one caveat to that anecdote. Elaine will remember this. As I was about to go up on stage in Book Passage, this distinguished-looking gentleman taps me on the shoulder, and I'm thinking, oh, God, not now, you know. I'm just about to go up. I don't need to uh, be distracted. And he said, uh, hi, I'm Michael Andanche. I came to hear you read. <laughs> <laughs> and if I wasn't nervous before that, I, <laughs> I certainly was nervous after that. But uh, I remember that as the moment when I, I sense, uh, you know, this story is really taking hold. And um, uh, great gratitude to Elaine. Uh, for being one of the early champions of this book. Thank you so much. What a bold thing for you to do, though, to tell a story from the womb. Um, I think the only person I know who claims to have memory of being in the womb was Samuel Beckett. Um, I mean, this is inventive and kind of in some ways sui generis. I mean, it's very distinctive, and it's what fiction writers do, and what fiction writers who are willing to take those kind of chances get away with. I think it helps to have a great editor who, who sort of tells you when it's working and when it's not working. For example, for, for those of you who've read the book, can I ask how many of you have actually read the book? That's oh, it's amazing, <laughs> wonderful. But there are people who have not, so we'll have to be conscious not to ask questions like, uh, why did so-and-so die and so on? We won't do that. Um, you know, but, but, but the, I forget the point I was going to make. <laughs> I got distracted by all those I was, things. I was, telling, I was giving you your bona fides. I was telling you how inventive it was to go into Yeah, the... so I was going to say that most of you would notice, or maybe not, that the book begins in the first person. And it begins with, you know, Marion saying, my brother Shiva and I were born in the year of the Lord. And then somewhere in there, the first person voice disappears. And the reader doesn't seem to ask, well, where'd the narrator go? Who's telling this story? And then the the first person narrator reappears somewhere later on. And, and my guide in doing that was, wow, I just saw people sitting up there. I didn't realize they're <laughs> sort of balcony. Wow. My, my guide in pulling that off was the Tin Drum by Gunter Grass. Uh, I don't know if you all remember this scene where Oscar is recalling how his grandmother got impregnated, how she was sitting in this potato field with her eight layers of petticoats and roasting potatoes on a fire. And in the distance, you could see this man running around being chased by the policeman. And he runs this way, he runs that way. And then he finally runs and hides under her skirts. And that is how Oscar's mother was born. <coughs> and you never, in that entire telling, ask how in the world could Oscar know these details? It, it doesn't occur to you because he pulls it off. So uh, I mean, a lot of it is just pulling it off and hoping it works. And a good editor tells you 
if you've done it or if you haven't. I hadn't thought of the Gunter Grass connection. In fact, one thinks when one reads your novel mainly of 19th century novelists. I mean, that you're really schooled and, and kind of immersed, aren't you, in 19th century novel? It's the kind of novel that I, I respond to. I, I, I've, to me, the magic of fiction is just that, that you, you uh, enter this other world, and the more foreign it is to you in many ways, the more delightful, and you live through several generations, and you, you, know, you get this wide body of knowledge and relationships, and when you're done, it's just Tuesday. And that, that sense of defeating time by virtue of fiction is, I think, the great joy of a novel. So I, I can't see myself writing a slim, minimalist volume, uh, you know, about something small. I, this is the kind of book that I had the ambition to write, and this is the kind of book that I love, as you, as you say. And a realistic book, I mean, just in terms of details. Uh, of course, your medical background served you pretty well, but you had to do a good deal of research, didn't you? For this book or for yeah. the... I had to do a lot of research. I, I, I did, uh, you know, volumes of research, and sometimes I think research is the writer's excuse not to write. You know, research. And a lot of writers say it's more fun than the writing. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, but there came a point where I clearly had much more research than I needed, and I think that that is helpful, though. You, you, you are so informed about this world that even a casual throwaway in one sentence speaks of the depth of your knowledge, and so you really have to know the world very well. And I. I'm not a surgeon by training, I'm an internist, which often surprises people. And when I came to that juncture in my life where I had to choose between internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, I, I loved everything, I really did. And I chose to go into medicine, but with some sense of regret that I was giving up the great folklore of surgery and the great stories and you know, the great joy I had doing surgery. Um, and so this book was in a way a means of you know, re reliving that life vicariously through fiction, even though I was not a surgeon. And feeling a kind of love for the characters as well as empathy and identification, all that, as the characters begin to round and become, well, able to cast real shadows for you as a writer? Yeah, very much so. I think that, uh, I think you have to have empathy and, and love for all your characters. Even your, even your, you know, your villains, if you have any, uh, shouldn't be just villains. They, they have to be people. I think someone asked, um, I think it's James Coburn or someone who, 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 James Coburn, I think, who plays all bad guys in all the movies. You know, he was known as, a, as the, you know, the person who plays the bad guy. And some reporter asked him, Mr. Coburn, how come you always play bad guys in the movies? And he said something like, son, I've never played a bad guy in my life. <laughs> Which is exactly how you have to play it. You have to play the character. He doesn't think he's bad. It's just his, his choices that make him you know, perceive that way. Or Macbeth, take Macbeth. You know, he, Macbeth kills people, for God's sakes, but the, the moment we see him crying over the blood over his hands, we say, oh, what a sweet guy, he's got a conscience, he's, <laughs> he's just like me. <laughs> and um, so my, my theory is that all your characters need to be lovable. They make choices that change their fate and those of people around them, but they still should be intrinsically lovable, with few exceptions. You know, at least three people came up to me um, before we came up here on stage and said, please, almost importuning, ask him about the title. And a few people had actually gone investigating the Hippocratic Oath, which is where we're told it's from. Um, give us a little bit of glossing on that, if you can. I will. I mean, this is a book in which I had the title from the very outset. And the, the title, the phrase to me is an evocative one, personally, because one of the great joys of my, my professional life is every year I get to stand with my students as they graduate uh, and they take the Hippocratic Oath or some version of it. And typically when they stand to take the oath, they also invite all the physicians in the audience to stand. So you have siblings and parents and, uh, you know, and then all of us faculty stand. And we say these ancient lines, you know, I swear by Apollo and, uh, you know, and one of the lines in there is, I will not cut for stone, but leave it to those schooled in the profession. And it's sort of an ancient line that has no relevance to current medical practice. And it, it, it stems from the time period when stones, bladder stones, kidney stones were epidemic. I mean, Michael, you can't imagine the burden of stone disease. Little children with grapefruit-sized stones in their bladders, screaming in agony for days till they mercifully go into kidney failure and die. Uh, you know, Samuel Johnson, we're told, uh, you know, had a catheter in his top hat and catheterized himself six times a day because of a big obstructing stone. 
they were individuals who went from town to town. They had learned the secret of being able to cut and take out the stone. So they would cut just above the pubic bone and fish the stone out from the bladder that way. Or they would put a finger in the rectum and one on the belly and push down and hook the stone down and make an incision two centimeters in front of the anus. So this may be a little more information than you want to. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry, Abraham, I'm just saying, I just passed the kidney stone two days ago. <laughs> but then when they were done, they would take their knife and wipe it on their cassock and head off to their next uh, surgery. So they were perhaps able to relieve suffering, but the mortality was probably horrendous. And the proscription in the Hippocratic Oath was, was to say, don't try this if you don't know what you're doing. And I always loved the ring of that, cutting for stone. It just seemed to have a nice ring to it, and I picked it as the title of the book, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm reluctant to admit to you that my characters were not called Stone. They were called Thomas Pickering, and uh, Marion Pickering, and Shiva Pickering, and there came a moment uh, four years into the book when I woke up one morning and I thought, you know, if, the, if I name them Stone, then this whole thing will seem so clever. It'll all <laughs> resonate, and you know, I, I have been saying that, but I, I must tell you that I, that I actually want to claim the idea of having named them stone because I think that is how novels work. You know, there are things brewing in your subconscious and sometimes your subconscious is way ahead of your conscious mind and, you know, periodically you catch up and those are the delightful moments as a writer when, when something breaks through that just makes a great deal of sense and you didn't know it and you just had to, you know, wait for, call it grace, call it... Uh, you know, call it time. Since uh, so many people have read the novel, can you think of another example that with the plot where you just suddenly had that kind of moment uh, that was unexpected and mysterious and just came upon you as a writer? Oh, many moments like that. What, any, off the top of your head. Well, for example, um, there, was a mo there was a time uh, halfway through the book, a little more, where, you know, I've been writing like this, pushing a voice forward, pushing an image forward, and it's very... And the narrative, and the plot. Yeah, and the narrative and the plot. And my editor called me up one morning and said, Abraham, there are too many possibilities now. You have to know what's going to happen. You can't go on like this, pushing it forward. And so I actually flew up to New York and met with my editor and we locked ourselves in a room and I free associated and she responded and we came up with the rest of the story. And I remember flying back home feeling so relieved that I didn't have to worry about what was going to happen. I could focus on language. Even so, there were huge moments when something quite unexpected would happen. And I knew it had to happen. Sometimes it was very moving to me. Uh, you know, the death of a character, I would actually cry just writing it. But I, I think the thesis is that if it surprises you as a writer and feels true, then you know it's going to feel true and surprising to the reader. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm still a believer in trying for structure, but trusting this, 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 um, call it the muse, call it the right brain, call it the subconscious, trusting that to be digesting your life and your ambition and making it come true. I've become a big believer in that. I mean, not just in writing, but also in life. I mean, you have your intention. There are things you want to have happen. You do your best. But there's a part of you, there's things that you can't change and you have to have a certain faith that this will come about by your belief and by your faith and, you know, or maybe it's not meant to come about, so something like that. I'm talking to someone who's uh, written a book about the existence of God or the lack. Well, I was going to ask you about <laughs> where you see all of that in this. Uh, any kind of cosmic order to things in mind or something that's pulling you in a higher direction or coming into your life in that fashion? Well, I'm impressed with the human need for, uh, you know, ritual, and especially the ritual of prayer, uh, the ritual of prayer, whether to a deity or many deities in, in the Hindu uh, you know, belief. Uh, I think that that, uh, my sense is that it's something fundamental uh, to being human. Uh, it doesn't presuppose the existence or lack of existence of God. It, it, it defines something about the human uh, soul that, that needs that interchange. I mean, uh, I grew up uh, in a very strict Christian household, very orthodox Christianity, long church services in a language that nobody could understand. And, you know, as a child, this kind of turns you off from organized religion. And yet, when I've reached the age I have now, I, I have become sort of so admiring of my parents for whom that ritual, all these years, now they're in their 80s, remains a very, very important ritual. And um, 
to see the benefit it brings to their life, that ritual, is something that sort of seals my, my sense of ritual being important. Mm -hmm. You'd uh, mentioned before that your parents are school teachers, and I'm curious to know a little bit about your values, and it leads us into this whole area of medicine and how you think medicine should be practiced, because you have clearly a humanistic vision of medicine, and you've gone on uh, many occasions uh, with all the attention that the book has been getting. I even saw a video of you with, standing there with Martha Stewart um, uh, and, and talking about the importance of touching, the importance of not, uh, Elaine talked about examining, but how a physician really needs often not only to engage with the patient, but to touch a patient and let the patient know there's something tactile between them, some kind of maybe communion or exchange. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that I must say that I didn't, I didn't start off that way as a physician. In fact, I, I, I think that I was caught up as a young physician in what I call the conceit of cure. The sense of, you know, we could fix anything and if we can't, it's because the patient came too late or the protoplasm was weak and, you know, it wasn't our inability. It was just a, you know, a frail patient or something. And a generation of us growing up that way were humbled by HIV, by AIDS. Uh, I was an infectious disease specialist. Uh, I went into that because to me it was the one specialty that was all about cure. You know, I looked at the cardiologists putzing around with their rotorooters and, you know, <laughs> doing what they do and apologies to my cardiology friends. And, and to me, infectious disease, by contrast, you could, you know, make an astute diagnosis and the patient would rise like Lazarus and walk out of there. And so it was so ironic that a fatal illness like AIDS should land in the laps of people like me who would chosen infectious disease because it's all about cure. And I think a generation of us were not only humbled, but we, we learned the difference between healing and curing. And in a sense, I think that's what mm. I try and get at both in the novel and in my professional work. The, the way I explain that to my students, healing and curing, I, I always say to them, imagine you're going back to your house after this you know, session we're having, and you find that your door is in splinters, the lock is in pieces. You walk in and all your belongings are strewn around and your valuables are taken. Your jewelry, television, computer, your iPod, I tell my students, you know, that they can really <laughs> relate to the loss of that. And then, you know, you will be devastated because you have lost physical stuff, but you're devastated also because someone has violated your, your, your space. You have a spiritual violation, you have a physical loss, if the police come by an hour later and say, we caught the person that did this, here is all your stuff back, at that moment you are cured, but you are not healed. Your sense of violation lingers and you might actually move from that house or that apartment. And You know, it's a simple thesis, but I would subscribe to the notion that any illness has those two facets. There is a physical loss, you know, explainable in metabolic terms or anatomical terms, and sometimes medicine can restore that, sometimes it can't. But there's always a sense of also, why me? Why now? And my profound faith and belief is that we have as much of an obligation to address the spiritual violation as we do the physical violation. And you, and you do it by listening. You do it by doing a careful examination. You do it by, uh, by the ritual of the examination, which, you know, my examination does not beat a CAT scan but it can pick up a lot of things and tell me that I don't need the CAT scan or need the CAT scan, you know, so I believe in that ritual for all these very reasons, but especially because I think that that's what heals is that kind of a, a bond. Uh, someone once described the physician-patient relationship as two souls intertwined. And let me tell you, that might sound like hyperbole, but if you have cancer or HIV, that is the kind of relationship that you want with your physician. It's not hyperbole. Of course, your novel is about loss, and it's about healing, and it's about breaking and heal and, and suturing and coming to some kind of way to repair what is broken. I mean, not only physical terms, but as you suggest, spiritual. And one can't help but realize that love and family play central roles, aside from ritual, aside from the connectedness and empathy that one can get from a physician. Could you talk about how love and family figure into this in your novel and in your vision of things? Well, I think that was probably the other lesson of, you know, watching young men predominantly my age die 
well before they were ready to die. Um, you know, it was really quite, quite uh, poignant as an observer and their physician to watch them die and watch in the last moments of their life as they searched for meaning. I mean, they were asking the fundamental question that we all ask, where does meaning reside in my life? Especially now that I'm dying at this young age. And it was very interesting to me that most patients came to an answer. And not only that, most patients came to the same answer. And not only that, it was an answer that I thought that I could use, we could all use, because what they found was that ultimately at the tail end of a life, what mattered was not good looks, reputation, money, and none of those things really held up when you're on your deathbed. And instead, the only thing that sort of helped them endure and gave them meaning in their life was the successful relationships that they had nurtured over a lifetime, particularly with parents, but also siblings, significant other children. And you know, that was a very obvious lesson to me, a very you know, a lesson that I should have been taught in medical school on day one, perhaps, and, but maybe I would never have been ready to listen to that lesson. And I, I've, I still see essays written by physicians who've become ill, and the essay, in essence, says, stop and smell the roses. And my reaction to that kind of essay is, you schmuck, you waited till you got ill to understand that. You should have been <laughs> doing this for, your, you know, for yourself and your patients a long time ago. And, Maybe that's the sort it's of... It's an Ethiopian word, schmuck, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. Yeah. It translates into distinguished physician. <laughs> I mean, we, we can focus here just for a moment on medical training because you are a medical uh, professor of medicine. What is it that you try to convey to your medical students about this other dimension that you're talking about? I mean, what do you really try to teach them? Well, I think, first of all, that you, one can only teach by example. You know, that's the hard thing about medical training. You can't just distill this into a, a con video that you put on the internet and, you know, and it works for everybody. They have to sort of see you, me, taking the time with the patient. They have to sort of see you model the very behavior that you want uh, to create in them. And I think that's a powerful thing. I mean, if I am this way, I can only give credit to the teachers I saw who were this way who stopped everything and held up the whole team to have this conversation that to us young physicians seemed a waste of our time at that moment. But the importance this senior professor gave it made us understand that this was important. Um, so, but when I talk about medicine to them, I, I, I always tell them that I think that they should never underestimate the importance of the ritual of examining the patient. It's become almost a travesty. Uh, the way we examine patients these days. Uh, we've become so dependent on our technology that, my, you know, and I'm not a Luddite, I, w I wind up saying that 10 times a day, but I, I joke, and I only half joke, that if you show up in one of our emergency rooms missing a leg, uh, no one will believe you till they get a CAT scan, MRI, orthopedic consult. <laughs> you know, and, and the consequence of not having faith in the exam is twofold. One, we miss obvious things that should have been picked up a long time ago. But more than that, there is a ritual taking place when you examine a patient. I mean, think about it. One individual is coming to another and telling them things that they won't tell their spouse or their rabbi or their priest, but they're telling you. And then they disrobe and allow touch, which in any other context is assault. Tell me that that's not a ritual worthy of our best efforts. Uh, the patient certainly expects that. And if you shortchange them by you know, putting your stethoscope on the gown, not getting them fully undressed, not doing a good examination, not showing that you've done this before and you have a flow and a rhythm to it, something fails. And I think a lot of the disquiet that we as patients have with medicine stems from that, the sense of, you know, we just didn't connect, we didn't form the bond. And I teach my students that that is central. The physician-patient bond is the beginning and the end of it all. And, uh, you have to form that. Even in this busy age with multiple specialists, you still have to form that. I mean, at Stanford, some of my patients are so complex. I mean, second liver transplant, this, that, and the other. I may be one of 50 doctors who see them in one day. And it it's often strikes me that they will say, I want to see that doctor. They can't say my name. It's got many syllables in it. And, and so they, they say, hey, you know, the guy, he looked like this. He looked like this. The guy who examined me so carefully. I mean, clearly it lingers with them. And, uh, William Osler said a hundred years ago, 
Patients judge you not by the diplomas on your wall, but the manner in which you examine them at the bedside. And I still believe that to be very true. We're going to take questions from the audience, and in fact, I think Elaine is going to bring them up here. But before we take these cards and, and throw some of your questions uh, at Abraham, um, what would you like, I mean, if you could crystallize what you would like your ideal reader to come away from this magnificent canvas that you've created and this epic story that you've created, what would it be? I think it would be very simply, only love endures. Only love endures. Are you writing another book? And can you tell us how you got from El Paso, Texas to Stanford? And will there be a sequel to Cutting for Stone? All one question. So I'm, I'm uh, gathering notes and gathering steam for another book. Um, and I'm, I'm just not quite ready to pull the trigger and say I'm writing another book because... You haven't it, figured out the locale yet, right? I, yeah, I'm wrestling with all those things. That's key, isn't it? That is very key. And, yeah. you know, the passion that readers are expressing for that story, uh, this story set in that locale, in that time period, makes it very tempting to go back there, even though I, I felt that there was nothing more I could say about this story anymore. But it is tempting, so I'm still thinking about different so ideas. You talk about setting for a moment, because you paint a picture for us uh, in the settings especially the natural beauty of Ethiopia. A lot of people think of Ethiopia, they think of these starving children yeah. and, and those kinds of images. You want a place that you can, again, kind of bring visually to us, don't you? Yeah, and, you know, I love that, that notion that, you know, in this day of the television camera intruding on everything, I mean, you, it's in the bedroom, it's in the operating room, it's, it's everywhere. It gives you this illusion that you've been everywhere. Well, you know what Ethiopia looks like, you know this and you know that, but I think it's really wonderful to know that the, the written word can evoke something even more dramatically than the camera can. And this is why reading Somerset Maugham about uh, his, even his writings about Tahiti, you know, the life of Paul Gauguin, it's so evocative. It's just taking a camera and showing you beaches and, you know, uh, people with, you know, wearing very little clothing doesn't quite do that. Uh, in quite would, you read it, would you rather read Maugham or look at Gauguin? Oh, I love Maugham. I love uh, Elf Human Bondage and, uh, you know, um, the, the novel about Paul Gauguin. What was that? The Razor's Edge, I yeah. think. Um, but the question about El Paso is really interesting because when I was leaving the Iowa Writers' Workshop, I was at a point in my medical career where I could have gone to a prestigious place, I suppose, and uh, continued as an associate professor and moved on. But I recognized that I, I probably wouldn't be, ha have much time to write. And so I went to El Paso, Texas, to Texas Tech Medical School, where the only thing they wanted of me was to see patients, and teach medical students at the bedside, which are my two great loves. And I could have my evenings and weekends to myself. I didn't have to write grants and publish papers, which, you know, I did a little bit of that, but that wasn't going to get me fired or not fired. You know, they were happy to have me. I was happy to be there. And in that place, I wrote the two books, the first two books. And, I, and you know, I always think it's ironic that had I come to Stanford in the first place, uh, I probably would not have written anything, and just about now I would have lost my tenure and I would be heading to El Paso, Texas, you know. <laughs> so, I think that, um, you know, I, I look back with some pride uh, in having made that decision and uh, with great joy that, it, it, that, that my writing has sort of been taken into the mainstream. The, the great thing about Stanford is their vision, their, their ability to encompass different things, and they have taken me and allowed me to have protected time to write. Uh, treating my writing as my research equivalent. I mean, that has not happened in my 20-something years in medicine, so it's wonderful Very to have unusual. that. Very unusual. I'm sorry? Very unusual. Very unusual, and, and also I have the platform of Stanford to, you know, to advocate for the things that I've been advocating for many, many years, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful leverage to be there on that bully pulpit and, and speak out, and so I'm very grateful uh, to them. Because what you see in the book is really ultimately how you collaborate, as you suggest, with the book and how the meaning is derived for you as the reader. And that's really what it's all about, that Absolutely. relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I love Somerset Mom. He isn't around to ask what he meant by this and that's that. Right. So it doesn't really matter. What I, what I believe he meant is what matters. And that's, that's the theme. Was the three-part structure of the narrative intentional or a result of the editing process? And do you enjoy the editing process stage in your writing? Does it have a three-part structure? That would be, uh, <laughs> that would be news to me. Um, 
I certainly didn't think in those terms. Uh, I did think in big movements. There was a, you know, the movement of the birth, there was the children growing up, there was the America section, and then there was the return to Africa. So in that sense, I, I, I think I saw a cycle. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, do you like editing, and uh, how important the is ending, the editing yes, The ending was, was hard. Uh, uh, and I don't want to give away to the, the ending to those of you who don't know it, but we had a backstory of what happened to Sister Mary Joseph Praise that went on for quite a few pages. And as I brought that back in at the very end, it became apparent that that was not necessary. There was another event, a very simple one, that could be the denouement, the, the sort of the tying together of everything of the book. And it was a very sort of, you know, it's one of those moments I remember, a breakthrough of creativity that said, oh, this will help connect this and explain that. And, you know, it's, it's a moment when everything connected. And, uh, and then my editor and I, who were the only two who had seen the manuscript by that stage, waited for my agent, the wonderful Mary Evans, to read it. And she had not seen anything of it till then. And we held our breaths. And uh, when she liked it and liked the ending, we, we sort of let our breath out. Uh, so it's a very treacherous moment. You hope that it works. How much was your editor important in this whole process? Would you, would you describe vital or maybe how vital on a scale, say, of 1 to 10? In my case, it was vital. I don't think that most people uh, have a novel, uh, write a novel with an editor quite this way. So I got a contract to write this book before it was done, which is very unusual for a nonfiction, for a novel. Nonfiction, it happens all the time. You make a proposal, you get a contract. But for a novel, typically you have to finish and then you sell the novel. But I was several hundred pages into this novel and I said to my agent, this is going to take me years. I need some affirmation that this is worth my, you know, the next decade of my life perhaps. And I'd like you to try and sell it. And she said, well, it's not done, but let's try. And there was a lot of interest. I think I'd thrown up enough balls in the air in the first hundred pages, you know, nuns and twins and... Um, <laughs> And then the challenge came to, you know, how do you pull it together? And given the way I wrote, when I didn't know what was going to happen, uh, you know, very often I would send Robin Desser, my editor at Knopf, several hundred pages, and she would, you know, call me up and say, Abraham, this is lovely material, uh, it just doesn't belong in this book. And, you know, <laughs> and I would have to retreat. And there were times when I was clear about that. I would write all this stuff and realize, well, that's not the book. And, um, you know, but I, I give her so much credit for her judgment. Had she said to me, Abraham, all this stuff about Ethiopia, the American reader doesn't really want to know about Ethiopia. Let's, let's focus on the Bronx. Had she said that, I trusted her so much that I probably would have done really? that. And I, I give her so much credit for having the faith that a story this foreign with um, characters and setting that are not, you know, the usual uh, settings would have uh, power. And so... Editors get far too little credit for the wonderful, wonderful job they do. And in my case, it was vital. What's the significance of the main character's heightened sense of smell? Is sense of smell a diagnostic tool for surgeons? Well, I, I, I think I made a lot of the sense of smell in the book. Um, but it's because I make a lot of it as a physician. I mean, I think there are common smells that uh, we can identify in the hospital. I can walk past the room and know that there's someone with hepatic coma in that room or close by. Such a peculiar, mousy, ammoniacal odor. Renal failure has its own smell, uh, you know. Uh, blood in the stools has a particular smell that nurses swear by, and they're usually right. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole sort of spectrum of smells, and they're useful diagnostically. And the strange thing is, um, I'll, I'll ask the medical students, I'll say, have you ever smelt hepatic coma? And they'll say, no, we haven't. I said, I guarantee you, you have. You just walked down the hall, you just didn't register. It was a funky odor and you went on. And it's lovely to teach them smells and have them discern something that they should be able to discern. I mean, we have wonderful olfactory apparatus and by God, we might as well use it. Someone who writes, I felt your book was also a crusade for the fate of young girls married too young, mothers and the physical problems that developed. Is this so? I don't know about a crusade. I think that's too, too strong a word. I, I don't think that you can proselytize in a book. It just doesn't work. So my ambition with this novel is very simply a good story well told. That, that was it. Uh, but I was calling on things that were hugely significant in my life as a medical student. I saw fistula. I learned about fistula. So fistula sort of emerged in the book as an important theme. 
Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know what fistula is, it represents, uh, you know, a sort of a breakdown in the tissues uh, after a prolonged obstructive labor. And I often think of it as not a medical disease, but a, but a, a, a reflection on the lack of infrastructure. Because it only happens when you marry girls too young. It only happens because their pelvis is already narrowed by rickets. It only happens because they get pregnant far too soon. And it only happens because labor goes on for four days before anyone acknowledges that this is not going anywhere. And it only happens because there are no roads to get them to the nearest place. And it only happens because if they get to the nearest place, there may not be anyone to deal with it. And so many of these women die. The baby certainly dies. And if eventually the woman survives, the baby comes out, the woman is often left with a rent between the bladder and the vagina and is always leaking urine. It was so common and it was unforgettable. It was one of the most you know, striking memories of my medical student days. So I described it because it was so real, as was genital mutilation. But I wasn't trying to proselytize or uh, I'm glad it's bringing a great awareness to... It was just in your consciousness, in your memory. Yeah. Well, it's my memory because it's very much something that, uh, you know, we saw just as in the HIV era, we saw so much Kaposi sarcoma common. Uh, I haven't seen Kaposi's in a year and a half for two years. Uh, it's become so rare. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, very much like that, fistula was, was and is still very common. And we have wonderful organizations that uh, raise money and, uh, uh, and uh, do something about that. And I'm glad the book has helped their cause to that degree. Will there be a movie of Cutting for Stone? Uh, yes, there will. So the, the, the movie rights was, well, I, I hope they will. The movie rights was just sold to a company called Anonymous Content. Uh, they are well known for taking films to completion. They made Being John Malkovich and uh, uh, a whole slew of other films that I, I can't quote you right now. So I'm very excited that, about that. And uh, they seem to be putting together the script and the director. And I hope there will be a movie. Um, it's bittersweet to think about that because uh, the, the movie is clearly a different product than the book and as I mentioned earlier, it will inevitably destroy the character that you created in your mind and how that character looked. And what do you see in your mind? Do you do any casting in the movie of your book? Um, you know, I, I've, I've always, uh, people have teased me about this, but I've always loved Kevin Costner in whatever movie he's been in. Uh, even the ones that have been utter failures, there's something about... Uh, Something very all-American about him that I admired before I, you know, before I was aware of that quality of his. Um, so I, I would love to see him in, in the movie, and um, if any of you knows him, just give him a copy of the book if you don't mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for a very memorable evening. Thank you evening. So very much. Abraham Brigade. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Carson.